This is Zach Weissmiller, and you're listening to the Matt Balaker Podcast. Hello, fine people. Thank you once again for tuning in to the Matt Balaker Podcast. I am very excited for today's guest because he's lived in Florida, California, and then back to Florida again. In addition to hosting the Just Asking Questions podcast, he's a senior producer at Reason. He helped create pieces on free speech, mental health, homelessness, drug legalization, and many other topics. Please welcome Zach Weissmuller to the show. How are you doing, Zach? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Matt. Well, this is uh, an episode I've been looking forward to for a while because I, I knew you largely from my brother's uh, interactions at Reason. You guys yes. produce content together. I'm sure you did all the heavy lifting and he took credit. Um, but I want to know, like, had such a slacker. He, oh yeah, he is. Um, and I want to get into that. Trust me, and, and feel free to <laughs> to let loose on it. Ted's. That's why Ted's I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> so this is really just a forum to bash my brother. But before we we get into that. Um, I want a little bit more of your origin story. Like, where where did you grow up, Zach? I grew up in Orlando, Florida, um, fa the favorite destination of Mormons worldwide, according to the <laughs> Book of Mormon, which uh, I assume is 100% accurate. Um, and yeah, just uh, outside of downtown Orlando, um, predictably worked at a theme park, not Disney, Universal Studios. Um, and yeah, just that central Florida life was, uh, pretty good. So I know central Florida is where many athletes at least have an address, but yeah. there are many factions within Florida. And for those of us who are in the state, can you kind of categorize some of the differences? Sure. Uh, central Florida, you know, when I was there, the, when I was growing up, this was the glory days of the Orlando magic. And so Shaq was there, Shaq, Penny, made a championship run that fell mm -hmm. just like a uh, heartbreakingly short. Uh, but yeah, that's the set. That's the central Florida uh, faction. And then um, South Florida is really its own culture, uh, you know, uh, kind of emanating out from Miami, obviously very uh, heavy Cuban population. And so culturally that has a large influence. And uh, I think South Florida is kind of like the stereotypical Floridian, like, <laughs> And if you go down there, you'll see people walking around in like, you know, Hawaiian shirts, like open and uh, palm trees and all that stuff. Uh, and now I live in North Florida, which is really wow. its own thing. It, that's almost just like South Georgia. Uh, so the weird thing about Florida that I've always said is like the further north you get, the more quote unquote south it is in some ways. Okay. So uh, up north, there are fewer hanging chads, but you're more Georgian. <laughs> and right. uh, I, I wanted to get your opinion. What stereotypes about Florida, or if we want to say Florida man, are true? Yeah. Oh, all of them. Um, you know, the. <laughs> <laughs> you you know you walk into convenience stores with flip flops with an alligator under your arm and people are like hey how uh so uh, how are you this Thursday there's no <laughs> no it, it's um I mean yeah there's a certain wildness uh down here a, a certain like um I think a lot of people come here it, it you see it portrayed in movies all the time the the villain from the movie or like the anti-hero from the movies always escaping to florida so there is that aspect like people escaping things i now am one of those people escaping california and, and settling back here in florida um and so there's a there's always been a little bit of like that uh you know we are our own thing type of energy it's like it's similar to texas in that way um and it's only gotten more so since moving back and you know covid really differentiated the states more so than they ever have been before so i think there's a lot of florida pride uh right now L -l lots of florida pride i think most of it is a result of you being there but I, that's that's my own theory zach uh, you mentioned you worked at a theme park um yeah whether it was that job or your other early jobs, what are some lessons you learned from them? 
Well, when I worked at the Universal Studios, I was on the Shrek 4D experience and a, I was a performer. So I would be the person who, when everyone's filing into the room, I had to give a little spiel that was partly pre-written, but also they kind of gave you a wide leash. So I, I guess that gave me some skills in terms of talking on a microphone and mm -hmm. uh, being able to speak in front of a crowd comfortably. I'm not a natural extrovert. So being kind of put in that situation was valuable. Um, and, you know, learning how to keep people interested uh, in your message, even if the message is just like, move all the way to the right side of the room, please. <laughs> You're slowing everyone the hell down. Um, so that, that was one thing. Um, and then, I mean, I think any, I think it's good for anyone to start working from, you know, teenage years on just to get your reps in and understand, you know, what it is to actually put in some time doing something that you might not be thrilled about at the moment, but you, you know, put on that, that happy universal face, have some, some customer service, uh, that was all pretty valuable. Um, I guess in terms of other jobs, one of the grinds that I did when I first moved to LA was I was a telemarketer oh, and wow. yeah, because I wanted a job that was flexible because I wanted to do entertainment industry stuff and work on mm -hmm. productions and be able to do that whenever. And this was just the, this was before Uber and the gig economy and everything. So this is one of the only jobs where like, you make your own hours. Uh, the problem is when you show up for those hours, it's you sitting in a room asking people for money on the phone and them yelling and hanging up on you. Um, it was for like nonprofits and charities. So it wasn't mm -hmm. as bad as selling like AT&T subscriptions or something <laughs> like that, but Amway it, product. That, and it was, it was quite miserable often, but that misery was useful in terms of teaching some resilience and just expecting people to say no to you and keeping going. <laughs> um, I'd never been in a sales job before and uh that has just been an incredibly useful skill for me forevermore because e even now when i'm going out to ask people to 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 be on my show or be in this documentary i know that you know i i'm not afraid to go ask someone who might be you know quote unquote out of my league or something like that because mm -hmm. i don't I, I'm not sensitive. I have a thicker skin about people saying no and rejection and all that. And also I can interpret something that is maybe a no for now, but not necessarily closing the door completely. And so just the the perseverance of that kind of job was useful. It's, it's a lowercase no. Uh, one of my first jobs yeah. is telemarketing and mm -hmm. as well, and it, it, it's brutal, but yeah. getting used to rejection helps us in so many facets of life. And you know, especially uh, for someone with entertainment pursuits. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a great way. I mean, the entertainment industry is, is not known for being kind or necessarily saying yes a lot, but what kind of motivated you, Zach, to want to attempt a career in entertainment? I, when I was at the University of Florida, I was a journalism major, journalism in English, and but on the side, I got involved with a film club, and there was no formal film school at UF. FSU has a pretty good one, but I was not there because I'm a diehard gator. And, Go Tebow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. I was there for the tail end of the Tebow years. It was an exciting time in sports. Oh, the bizarre. Urban Meyer legacy. Wow, that's that's yes. a whole other episode. I was there for the football and basketball. So, you know, uh, exciting All the Joachim times. Noah, uh, yeah. Billy Donovan, was it two? I, I went to UCLA. I graduated, you know, long before you. But uh, I, I remember the pain that team caused. But please continue. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I still bleed orange and blue, Matt. Um <laughs> So, but yeah, so I, I was in, I joined a film club, uh, which is where funnily enough, I met my wife, uh, my future wife. And we, uh, what we would do is we had a contest or like a kind of almost like a tournament where every month we would make a short film and everyone else in the club would make a short film and people would judge them. And so it was like a little film festival every week. 
and I loved it. I just started slacking off on all my other work and doing <laughs> that instead. And, you know, d winning these like meaningless uh, film <laughs> contests. But it was great uh, practice again, just doing it, just being like, okay, I got to come up with an idea and I have to finish it and show it by the end of this month. Um, showing, like proving to myself that I could do that was valuable. And I wanted to keep on that path. And my wife uh, had done an internship in LA as a casting director and she liked that. And so she wanted to move out to LA and we moved out together after we graduated. And she was extremely successful right away because she knew exactly what she wanted to do. To do. I did a lot of just like low rent <laughs> jobs. I worked as a telemarketer and uh, hosts at a restaurant and eventually, you know, I did some production work. I ended up working for a talent manager, uh, w for a while. Um, and then when I was working at that talent, uh, management agency, which was totally the wrong job for me, I, so wh why, why is that? So why was it the wrong job? Um, you know, actors, actors are really annoying. Um, what? What yeah, her, you know, I I won't say anything bad about her roster. She had she had some <laughs> some great uh, actors on there, including um, uh, Uncle Phil from uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air was one of her clients. He was a super nice guy. Rest in peace. But um, she, uh, while I was working there, you know, I'd been a reader of Reason for since college, and I saw that they were launched that they launched Reason TV. And mm -hmm. that they were looking for to hire, um, you know, basically interns, paid interns. And I thought this is the perfect fusion of my interests in journalism and politics and libertarian ideas and video production. <laughs> and so I did an internship there under the tutelage of your slacker brother, Ted Balaker. <laughs> uh, no, I... Ted, uh, honestly, uh, was a mentor to me and he, uh, helped me to, you know, take me to the next level and, uh, basically was crucial in securing me like the full-time job there. Um, and then kind of teaching me to make my own short documentaries and I loved it. I've been there ever since. That, that's wonderful. And, and I, I say this with a hundred percent sincerity, uh, I, you know, I would watch the content that was produced, but not, not every day. And I remember when Ted was kind of spearheading the reason TV, it, it was sort of shifting away from just print to video, which I thought was cool. And then yeah. when you joined, it was very prolific. Like I remember I had, I had a real job for a while and I would waste time because you guys were producing really <laughs> cool stuff. And yeah. I think what, what sticks out around that time. That's is, why we're is, there, Matt, to waste your time. Oh, you totally did. I was like, I don't want to actually help you know, people make money. I want to learn more about the non-aggression principle or why <laughs> saving, like why legalizing drugs solves all our problems. But you guys were doing some, some really cool stuff. And Thanks. I guess I'm, when you're in that niche, it's pretty narrow. And, and I, I, I should also ask my brother this. I mean, he's now doing his own thing, but mm -hmm. they probably know if you have a libertarian bend, there aren't many other options in Hollywood, especially then. Um, yes. How did that kind of influence your your mindset or, or I guess bargaining power too? Um, my mindset, like going into a project or well, well my... when you're at a place like yeah. Reason, and, and and this might be weird because you're you're still there, but it's like yeah, it's a think tank for lowercase L libertarians, you know, yeah. for the most part. If you're in there, you're probably motivated by more than just money. You know, it's it's, yes. it's a place with like-minded people where you can share ideas that outside of that bubble, Zach, many people aren't talking about, well, especially 10 years ago. Um, yep. How did that influence, I guess, your mobility? Because I'm sure you have bad days there. You're, you have bad days now. You know, everyone does that work. But like, I guess, hmm. how, how does that change your mindset, if, if at all, when, if, you're, if you have a bad day? Well, when I... I started there, um, what I really liked about it was that it was, they really were on the frontier at that time in terms of digital video. Um, and my, and as I just outlined there, my whole 
introduction to all this was digital video, uh, which opens up all sorts of new opportunities because of the the democratizing aspect of bringing the production down where you can do it all with your own cheap camera and your laptop. Um, that was what was really exciting to me at, at mm -hmm. the time about what was happening. This was, you know, 2000, you know, I graduated in 2007. So it was that like 2007 to 2011 era when a lot of this was really changing and disrupting the entire industry. And I liked being on the frontier there. Well, like, you know, Hollywood, which I had dipped my foot into, was still a kind of a like, it was still a, a step or two behind. It was trying, it was trying to catch up. Um, and now, you know, everything is that. So it's hard to even for people to even remember maybe that it there was like the holdouts who were like, I'm just going to shoot film forever and everything. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but yeah, but um, so I liked the sort of outsidery and um, like experimental nature of it. That was a appealing to me. It always has been appealing to me, and that's what has sustained me there, like through to this day. Is the that reason gives a lot of latitude, like perhaps. Mm -hmm partially because of its libertarian ethos. It's yeah. like, we're going to give you, you are an autonomous agent who uh, we're going to trust you to some degree, especially if you prove yourself by putting out things that do well or are high mm -hmm. quality. We're not going to micromanage that. And that level of autonomy and creative freedom is what has kept me there all mm -hmm. these years if, if that's kind of what you're you're asking yeah, um yeah you know because yes there's hard days there's days where things don't go well yeah. or you're frustrated by how something went it, you know something that you worked really hard was received like it didn't land the way you wanted like that's all really frustrating and heartbreaking and stuff but ultimately the fact that it's not the end of the world there. Like if you yeah. put out something that wasn't a huge hit, like they're just like, keep going. I'm like, I love that. I I just want to keep going and growing and learning and experimenting. Yeah. That, that chance to experiment, especially in showbiz is, is, is super important, but I think it's, it's fairly rare. And I, I want to get your take, Zach. Um, like if you work at a kind of traditional movie house, for lack of a better word, it's, sales, ticket sales that are probably key performance indicators. When you're at a place like a nonprofit, like Reason, what are some of the numbers or the key performance indicators that kind of determine whether a piece of content is a quote unquote success or not? Yeah. Well, you know, I always did feel that we were in a way very accountable to numbers because all our stuff went up on YouTube and they oh. have a public count, <laughs> a public view count. And so there that that's not the end all be all for us by any means, but it was it's always something that you can't deny. And so it would always be this situation where we would be putting all our stuff out, out there on YouTube. And then I would be seeing all this other stuff like self-hosted or even, you know, on little like streamers or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know, how much reach is this really getting? Because, you know, m our numbers are like out there in, in public. Um, so that that is one number. Mm -hmm. um, now it's even that it was kind of simpler in those days because YouTube was the place. Now we're just scattered all over the place. Right. So we got YouTube, we, we're on Facebook, we've got put stuff on X now, Rumble, mm -hmm. all these different places, the podcast that I do is in all those places, plus the audio versions. And so there's, you know, spreadsheets that track all that stuff. And I d even don't know exactly how much to value, like what's an iTunes download worth versus a YouTube view. So we're still, we're always like adjusting and trying to like decide what we value most there. Mm -hmm. um, but then also there's value in um, getting, like wider recognition one of the mm -hmm. 
recent uh, pieces that I collaborated with Liz Wolf, my co-host on, uh, was a documentary about homelessness in Texas that won an LA Press Club Award. So that, you know, I mean, that that was a good documentary. That that was a win all around because it was it did well on YouTube and it got outside validation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the one of the big sort of uh, you know less numbers based ones that comes to mind is not one of my accomplishments, but I think of uh, a video that uh, Meredith and Austin Bragg, who are <laughs> part of our comedy team, did great, great years stuff ago. There. Yeah, and it wasn't even a comedy video that I'm thinking of. It was a video about the Commerce Clause. Uh, so this like sort of, you know, nerdy legalistic look at this very important part of the Constitution that, it, that vastly mm -hmm. expanded government power. And then that video was cited it, by the Supreme Court. And so that's like, you know, you can't, that, you that's it. huge. Uh, yeah, so there's all sorts of things like that that we use to measure success. I, I think uh, an important aspect of success for think tanks is how many ways can your message get out there where people who might otherwise never heard of it are now talking about it. And you, you've done that reason and, and kind of like the, you know, tentacles that that reason has created over the years has, has been just awesome. So, uh, yeah, Although, let me say to... one thing, let me say one thing about that though, because like, you know, Re, like Reason TV and the magazine, the website are funded by Reason Foundation, which is the has a think tank as part of its operations. And the think tank comes up with policy papers that they try to persuade lawmakers to implement, usually at the state level. And then the journalism division is we, there's almost like a firewall between us and the think tank. Um, and so mm -hmm. like, I know people at the think tank, but um, we're not like, you know, uh, workshopping ideas together or anything like that. The, our, our job is first and foremost journalism. So mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, at, at least that's my job. I'm part of the journalism division, the, the stuff that the Braggs do and, the comedy sketches that Remy does, that's a little bit different, but my job is to do video journalism. And so we, you know, have our pri our libertarian priors, which we don't hide uh, at <laughs> all. Uh, everyone knows that reason is coming from a, the, it's right there in our tagline, free minds and free markets. Um, but I follow the basic rules of journalism whenever I am pursuing a story, which is to bring fairness and uh, br be open-minded and be willing to go into a story that maybe I think is one way and have my mind changed or like slightly adjust what I thought this was all about at the end of the day. And that happens all the time. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think you do a superb job of balance and presenting arguments, especially ones you probably don't agree with in a journalistic manner. And one topic that's pretty hot right now, Zach, is, you know, bias in journalism. I mean, that that's, yeah, it's been hot for, for decades. Um, Anything with humans is going to have inherent biases. And you said your know, reason is pretty upfront, free minds and free markets. Um, stepping outside of the reason bubble a little bit, what are some practices that you would like to see journalism outlets or journalistic outlets um, implement? Yeah, I think that th there has to be more clarity about whether you are um, maybe we call it an opinion journalist or a journalist with a point of view in the way that I am, um, or whether you actually are attempting to be quote unquote objective, which is not really possible, but you can at least like give it the old college try. Um, and what has happened is that, so the way reason does it is we're just transparent about the fact that we're coming to you from a libertarian perspective. We're gonna cover the stories that we think people who are at least in interested in hearing from that perspective wanna hear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where what you have is a sort of uh, hidden version of a uh, point of view coming from s outlets that have positioned themselves as being objective. 
New York Times, obviously, being the <laughs> premier example um, of an outlet that now I think everyone except kind of the most like blinkered reader would acknowledge has at the very least a center left bias, many, many times more than center left bias. Um, they also had the whole sort of a great awakening or social justice takeover that happened between 2016 and 2020 that skewed really skewed their coverage and I think damaged their brand for a lot of people. Um, there are other outlets out there that are doing what I think is a useful course correction. There's we Liz and I interviewed a journalist from Axios. I don't know if you ever read that. Oh, outlet. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good outlet because it they are very conscious of separating their reporting from their analysis. Like they they programmatically do it. It's like part of the design of their stories where they're like, we're gonna give you like three bullet points up top that just tell you, you know, what you need to know in the story. And then we're gonna lay out some facts at the top. And then like the bottom part of the story is gonna be this writer's like take on it where mm -hmm. you're gonna get a little bit more analysis or opinion. I think that's a good direction for media to be going because then people understand what they're getting and they're not going to feel like it's being snuck in there in a dishonest way. I, I like that. I mean, I, I've brainstormed some ideas. Like, I don't know if they'd ever work, but I, I, I would love to see newspapers or just press outlets that might say X number of people voted for this candidate last election. Well, and, and we do I, that. Reason does that. Uh, okay. Like every election year, we're, I, we're the only publication that I know of where the staff, the whole journalism staff publishes who they vote for or if they didn't vote at all, which is very common among libertarians. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a publication that covers politics, that kind of seems like a no brainer that you would want to know where they're coming from. Um, and if you're like, well, uh, as a political journalist, then that will color the way that people, you know, perceive my objective work. Well, then it's like, that's your problem. Um, and if you can't separate your personality from your reporting, or you feel like your viewers can't do that, then just don't vote and say and make that your rationale for right. not voting at all. If if it's going to compromise you in that way, which I think I, I'm coming around. Like I've always been the like I think libertarians should vote, uh, which weirdly is a controversial position at, at reason. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, yeah. But now, this year I'm I am finally coming around to the idea that like maybe I just shouldn't at all. So uh, yeah. I was having that same thought last night, uh, actually the last couple of weeks, and I don't want to turn this into who who should Matt Balaker vote for, but um, <laughs> I do, I'd, I'd like to get your summary of the argument in favor of not voting, because I've, I've heard it, but I don't think many people in this audience are as familiar with it. So if you don't mind kind of yeah. giving the elevator pitch for why people, wh why not voting isn't the worst thing ever. Yeah, I'll do my best because this is Catherine Mangu Ward, uh, Reason's editor in chief, is the big proponent of this. She's a principled non voter. Um, and I've always taken a little bit of issue with, with her argument, which maybe I can weigh in with here as I explain it, but I'll do my best to explain it as I understand it, which is that A, there's a, there's like rational self interest in just not wasting your time voting, there's better things to do mm -hmm. than vote. And even if you're a political person, there's better uses of your energy mm -hmm. than voting, such as writing stories for a reason or, you know, expressing your opinions on social media. And then the other thing is that a lot of libertarians and anarchists just they view our system as illegitimate and that by participating in it, you are giving it legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it would be better to, if you're, if the idea of voting is you're sending a signal, the signal you're sending by consciously not voting is that this is an illegitimate system that I will not partake in. And therefore, uh, the more people who do that, 
the more it undermines it and makes people question whether this actually represents, quote unquote, the will of the people. That was a really good summary. And I think one way that that's helped me look at it is put it in business terms. It's like if you're selling a smartphone for $1,500 or something super high, and there are a large segment of the population that isn't purchasing it, it motivates the producers to be like, either we need to lower the cost, improve the features of it. There's an un untapped market. And that's kind of what I'm leaning towards right now is like, I want I'm politically homeless in many ways. Yeah. It's like, I, I kind of want to be wooed. And if if no one's doing a good job, I think candidates knowing, all right, there's this population out there that we could get their vote, but we're not. So something yeah. should change. Let me give the my counter argument to why okay. I think libertarians should vote. Oh, please, yeah. Vote. See, although, you're such a journalist. Least, I like the balance. Yeah. Although I'm... I. As I mentioned earlier, I'm starting, I'm getting less sure of this by the day as the, basically our options have gotten worse and worse over time. <laughs> but um, I think that if you believe in the principles of, you know, limited government and individual rights that you should want, uh, probably want as many other people who sh roughly share that to be voting. Um, mm -hmm. All, all uh, like it's it, like the likelihood of getting a slightly better outcome if those people are voting rather than sitting on the sidelines does seem to be increased. And so if I want that, then I also should vote, especially as a like, pub, you know, semi public libertarian figure who mm -hmm. puts out my vote and whether I right. vote or not, that if I'm, I'm saying I think you as a libertarian should be like, doing a little bit to push this in a more libertarian direction, then I, you know, it's kind of silly for me to ask you to do that, but not do that myself and kind of like try to weigh, like seriously weigh like out of these options, out of these two options, or if you're even putting third parties in the mix, three or four options, is there actually a better outcome from our perspective than, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's that's worthwhile, but um... it's kind of working within the system and there are practical benefits to doing so, especially in certain states. If there are X number of votes, you ensure yeah. ballot access for for subsequent years. So, I mean, there, it, it's not just theoretical, but um, Zach, there are some people who will be voting for uh, Kamala Harris and her her vice uh, president. Um, yeah, Tim, Tim Walls was, was recently new. So I want, I want to share a clip. But in Minnesota, we respect our neighbors' personal choices. We may not agree with them or make them from ourselves, but I've been saying this, you all know it, our golden rule is mind your own damn business. Zach, does that mean that uh, Tim Walls is a libertarian? <laughs> he's. It means that he's espousing a very libertarian idea, which I will take the W on that, um, just like I'll take the W on the fact that Donald Trump bothered to show up at the Libertarian National Convention and try in his ham-fisted way to make the case as to why he is in some way, if you squint and turn your head enough, a libertarian. Um, but it doesn't make either of these people particularly libertarian that they're saying these words. Um, you know, Tim Walz was the governor of Minnesota, as he touts there, which famously set up the COVID snitch line so that if you see your neighbors out being naughty during COVID, you can report them to the government. And my understanding is that uh, some members of the legislature tried to shut that down and Tim Walls fought against it. So that definitely doesn't sound like minding your own damn business. Um, and I also know that he oversaw uh, an exodus from his state, just like I was part of the exodus from California. A lot of people have fled Minnesota in recent years, I think in no small part because they are a high tax, high mm -hmm. regulation state. The uh, Cato Institute ranked him, uh, I think it gave him like a D minus or something like that on their governor's report card because of those issues. So, it, you know, while I appreciate the, the tip of the cap to the idea of minding your own damn business, which is an important, an important American value. Um, I'm not quite buying it from the Walls-Harris ticket. 
Yeah, I mean, implementing this in practice, like every major party has pet causes that it can say, we're minding our own business. I mean, it, yeah. it's just as true for the right, but then they'll, they'll you know, support wars all over the, you know, the country, all over, all over the globe, I should say. And they're, they're largely in support of tariffs, which I don't think is minding your own business. And also, wow. like, I, I cringe when I hear talk about price caps uh, from the Harris campaign, which is literally getting in someone's in business's business and saying you're you yes. shouldn't charge this i mean it's it's a good talking point and unfortunately there's going to be some people that just hear that but i think providing context and one of the reason many reasons i'm glad to have you on is like the libertarian camp is a lot more consistent when it comes to minding your own business than any of the major yeah. parties it reminds me of one of the first videos i did one of the early videos I did for Reason is I went to the DNC in 2012, and I, I they had the they had pro choice were were the pro choice party like everywhere. <laughs> I, and I love I this. Just, please continue. Yeah, <laughs> I just asked Democrats. Okay, so you're pro choice. You're okay with abortions, and they're like, yeah, uh, we we're definitely pro choice. And, and then I just went down the list like. This was back when the Democrats ever were trying to ban um, the incandescent light bulb. So I'm like, should people be allowed to have like a light bulb that's the hue that they watch? Should people be allowed to <laughs> send their kids to the schools they want to send, i.e. school choice? Should you be able to work at a workplace with a, that doesn't have a union in it, right to work laws? And of course, they were like, no, 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 no. I'm like, but you're, you're pro-choice, right? Right. Uh, should, like, should, yes, should you yes, be able to... 100% pro choice. So that is the that's always been the uh, uh, sort of pet peeve of mine at the at the center of the Democratic Party, you know, whatever your feelings are about abortion, um that is one important area of life, but beyond that, it's like can they make any credible claim to being the party of choice? Yeah, no that's that's I mean, you, you listed off, but I mean, in California, I mean, there, there's, you can't have a plastic bag in certain places. You can't smoke cigarettes pretty much anywhere. Trans fats are probably illegal in, in most of those places. I mean, there's so many aspects yeah. of our life that are eliminated or choice is eliminated. So to have any sort of consistency, you have to broaden the scope. And I mean, this, this could be another episode, but um, one uh, topic I want to touch on is uh, the libertarian candidate. Uh, yeah. For, for president, Chase Oliver. I'm mm -hmm. somewhat familiar with him. Um, I listened to the interview you and Liz, your your, uh, your co-host Liz Wolf did with him yesterday. There's a lot I like about him. I think one, he just sounds like a hell of a good person. And, and I, I mean that in like, I, I would like him around to, to uh, make decisions. I think if he were a congressman in my district, I would rally behind him. There are certain things I, strongly disagree with him about, but that's not the point of this show. The point is like, he's kind of controversial. Uh, the last candidate was Joe Jorgensen and then Gary Johnson, who I voted for both for disclosure, but they're fairly milk toast. What is it about Chase Oliver that kind of made him a lightning rod? Yeah, I don't even think that it's anything about him specifically i think it's the moment that the libertarian party and maybe the libertarian movement as a whole is in i see him very much in the gary johnson mold like i could mm -hmm. imagine gary johnson giving many of the same answers that chase oliver gives to us it's just that the libertarian party is in a very different headspace right now so they're reacting to things differently um, you know, for background, Chase Oliver is a um, he's from Georgia. He <laughs> was the quote unquote spoiler in the Georgia Senate runoff election. So he yeah, Herschel Walker is not a fan. Herschel Walker. Does yeah, not like yeah he he uh, forced uh, that race to go to a runoff by, you know, covering the spread between the two candidates. Um, and then Herschel Walker uh, lost the runoff. Um, and he's a I think he's like 37, 38 years old, openly gay, very socially liberal guy. Um, and the direction of the Libertarian Party was towards a more um, like on the almost conservative side of the, the 
culture war. Um, they, the, the, a kind of, uh, there's this, uh, takeover by a faction called the Mises caucus that, um, is against open immigration, which has traditionally been a libertarian mm -hmm. position. They, uh, don't, they have a lot of problems with some of the laws around transgenderism, uh, and think that the, they're making the case that uh, sort of childhood transition is a is a form of abuse, and and that's mm -hmm. where really that's probably the most controversial aspect of Chase the mm -hmm. Chase Oliver campaign. There's been a lot of discussion about that, um, and then generally the reason that Mises Caucus was able to take over the Libertarian Party in the first place was that the Libertarian Party was perceived as being weak on during the pandemic and not calling right. out all the authoritarianism that came out instead sending out messages like, you know, wear an extra mask or, uh, you know, be, be safe at Thanksgiving and uh, get 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 all your your boosters um, instead of calling out the uh, government overreach and yeah. chase. Uh, while he was never for lockdowns, he was never for uh, vaccine mandates. Um, he has old tweets out there that are like, you know, wear a mask, be safe, and that uh, the his detractors believe puts him in the like, you were a shill who fell for all the propaganda camp when mm -hmm. we needed to be like fighting against that. Yeah, and, and I give him a lot of credit for not taking his tweets down. And I yeah. give you and Liz even more credit for uh, giving him a forum to kind of present his side. And I, I thought in the last interview you did with him, he ducked some of the questions on like, are you woke? But then when he talked about his origin story, I mean, he's basically a converted Democrat. Yeah. And he voted for Obama. And I think in a, way, in a lot of ways, that's cool. You know, it shows people yeah. from different sides can join a different group and still have some some disagreements. And I think you did a very fair job of letting him explain his take on the vaccine mandates. And I guess more specifically, Zach, like, should private businesses be allowed to enforce them or not? And I thought that was a really nuanced and an important discussion. And on one, I just hadn't heard his side. And it's not an issue I care. I mean, I care about, it, but it's it's not like war or something that I, or drug yeah. organization that I'm prob probably more about. But I, I, I just, I want to Thank you, you and, and Liz, for, for giving him that forum. And then on that same interview, um, and I don't want to rehash all of it, Liz Wolf and Chase Oliver had a pretty strong disagreement when it comes to laws or I, I want to say um, decision makers with kids who have gender dysphoria and, and want to yes. transition. And, and that, again, I keep saying this, this could be another episode. I think the crux of the matter, and I, I found this just, strange and fascinating is Chase's line in the sand is anything quote unquote permanent, which he defines as surgical. Yes. But if it's chemical, he's, and I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, like it's, it's more reversible and he's not necessarily endorsing it for kids, but he's saying government should stay out of it. And Liz, who I think had a, a a hardline view on, on the, they were very respectful was more like, no, like it is overreach. I mean, you, you, the, the decision really is where does government step in? Not, not does it. Um, yes. And I say that because you did a hell of a job, Zach, on the fly of moderating that. Like and initially oh, I thought thanks. it was a debate when I, I, cause I just saw clips of that. Um, can you share with our audience kind of how you, stepped into that role and the dynamic you and Liz share when it comes to uh, addressing a controversial topic like that. Yeah. So Liz and I have been co-hosting this show for a while now. I think it's coming up on a year soon. Um, and we, one thing we've learned is that sometimes one of us will get in a little bit of a disagreement or an argument with a guest. And in that case, it's often good for the other one to step back a little bit and mm -hmm. let that discussion happen. And if we're going to get involved, try to get involved in more of a moderator position and like get to the root of what is 
the nature of this disagreement. Because I think sometimes when you're in a live argument with somebody, <laughs> you can kind of get stuck or like you can talk past mm -hmm. each other. I'm not saying this is exactly what happened with Liz and Chase, but um, the, the third person listener can kind of uh, sometimes see a little bit more clearly, okay, this is really the one key thing that they are getting hung up on. And so let's try to at least get some resolution there so that, that the, everyone listening can really understand what this disagreement really is. So mm -hmm. th that's what I was trying to do there. And I think that what their disagreement is, is what you were saying, which is where when is it appropriate for the state to intervene in a medical intervention? Um, mm -hmm. Is it for Chase, it's at the point of surgery because it's uh, an, an alteration to the body that cannot be reversed at all. Whereas I guess with hormones, you could uh, you know, revert back somewhat. I, I don't know exactly. I mean, hormones, yeah, that's, that's a hard uh, discussion. It, yeah. yeah, hormones at that age, you know, um, it's it very well could have permanent effects. People, some people, I, I mean, one of the effects of puberty blockers could can be like permanent sterilization, mm -hmm. and so that's why it's a it's a it's an important issue for libertarians to think about. Not only because it's something that now is, for whatever reason, at the front of uh the culture war but also it totally so is <laughs> it's like a relevant it's it's like whether you want to talk about it or not it's like seems to be constantly something someone people are talking about yeah. um but secondly i mean it does raise real issues of like as, as a libertarian who who respects bodily autonomy where do you draw those boundaries and i always think those are the most interesting kinds of questions for libertarians oh, to try to, the hard ones. It, it's fascinating. And I, I think the, the main question is, where is it the parents love and where is it abuse? And this yeah. is something, I mean, I grapple with it because five, 10 years ago, I, th I, I remember making this argument, we have to trust parents to do what's best for their kids. And I was thinking yeah. like those cases where people deny traditional medical care and they pray. And I've sort of changed on that because I'm like, most parents are great, <laughs> but child abuse exists. And I, I'm, yeah. I don't want to say what Chase is advocating is or isn't child abuse. Yeah. I, I think he's coming, like, I don't question his motives at all. Like, like I think he's he's totally sincere and, and, and a good faith actor in this. But I, I think there might be some weirdo parents who are like, my kids should not have legs. Right. And I, I, yeah. I, you know, I love them and I really believe that legs is a de are a detriment. And like that, that to me, I'm like, okay, like, that's just, no, sorry. Like that's abuse. Yeah. And this is a case where the state should intervene. Sorry. Yeah. But, the, but, and, but there's another layer on all this, Matt, which is, and part of the context of that conversation with Chase is just a, a week or two earlier, we'd had a long conversation with Jesse Single, who's a journalist that has mm -hmm. been covering the gender dysphoria beats for a long time and taken a lot of heat for it because he's come to unpopular conclusions like a lot of this is not really very well grounded in science whatsoever. And that is a big part of the problem is that I don't think that a lot of the parents who are doing this are abusing their kids in the like traditional way we think about child abuse. Right. It's that they have been told that this is just medicine. This is so Standard this is the science. Procedure, Trust yeah. the science. Trust this the science. This is what the Ameri this is what the American Medical Association, American Pediatric Association, smart doctors they, with big degrees say. say this. Yeah, but then what's happening is this is only the case in America. If you look at a lot of European countries, if you look at this big CAS review that just came out of the UK, they concluded, no, the science here is actually terrible. And mm -hmm. they haven't studied, they haven't properly weighed the risks and benefits. Um, and so they, in the UK, revoked, uh, pu they banned puberty blockers. They revoked uh, they limited uh, hormones uh, to like very specific cases. Um, surgeries mm -hmm. are after 18, like Chase is saying. Um, and then and, and puberty blockers are, are banned except for uh, clinical trials, which seems more appropriate because you're like, 
at the very least, you're acknowledging that this is not some settled area that you right. are taking on some risk in enrolling your child. There's some level of informed consent. And that is really what we should be striving for as libertarians who want people to be able to make their own choices. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you, you hit on another important topic is like the ability to have dissent within I would say consensus. I, I, this kind of yeah. harkens to the COVID issue some. And um, I, I think now that we can be devil advocates, the coffee maker, is those people within the medical community who had a non-consensus opinion, I think were largely silenced. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that shouldn't happen and, and hopefully we can learn from again. And so I, I, what I, what you're mentioning is like, just because a lot of people are saying something doesn't mean everyone feels that way. And when their political, or I guess you say more so um, personal economic pressures, maybe it's the American Medical Association, maybe it's, it's press, you know, you talked about this, there, there's a very activist class saying, when you write articles, you must use certain language. And yeah. that can, that can all, I mean, it's just an ability to have a dissenting voice without being shouted down and called all sorts of names is so important. Um, that brings up uh, kind of another topic I want to get your perspective on is uh, the last probably year I was turned on to the Part of the Pro Problem podcast. Um, uh, I know Dave Smith through, I mean, I know of him through comedy. I think he's, he's a very funny comedian. And you've done a wonderful job of, I think, giving him a platform, but also in, in my kind of outside baseball perspective, there seems to be a little bit of division between the quote unquote reason camp and the mm -hmm. Mises caucus camp. Um, what is your take? I mean, do you think that's good for the party? Good for the movement? Um, you know, you're, you're very level-headed. So I kind of like to get your take on, on what, what that aspect brings to the, uh, the LP. Well, first I'll just say that I think Dave Smith is great. Um, I've talked to him multiple times now on Reason's platform, um, although he doesn't need our platform. He's got a, his huge own platform, um, but I appreciate the sort of engagement because I think that what I appreciate about Dave is that he does, I do think he does his best not to straw man the other mm -hmm. side. He um, might be really critical of us, at least he hasn't done it to me. Maybe other people feel like he he has, but um, it feels like when he is criticizing or pushing back, he's he's actually making an argument, um, and he is persuadable. He so I, I feel like we've both changed each other's minds in small ways, talking to each other. And that's what you want out of a conversation. So that's why I'm happy to always have conversations with him. Um, the Mises caucus takeover as a whole, I think, is it's something that's yet to be seen, What like how successful that is going to be. Uh, I've always thought that this year, election year, this is going to be their proving grounds. Um, mm -hmm. They did not expect to have Chase Oliver as their candidate. They expected to have Dave Smith as their candidate. He couldn't run yeah. for personal reasons. Um, and then their preferred candidate just kind of, they're, they're like backup. Michael Rechtenwald kind of just face planted, a, a, yeah. took an edible. It may have, may have not been yeah, gummy related. But that's... Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, that was just, there were other issues there, I think. But um, also there are just a lot of what I would call straight up like bad faith trolls within that movement who put out statements just to elicit like maximal yeah. uh, social media outrage. Uh, and they're like very open about that. This is their strategy because we want to repel all the non hardcore libertarians. And that's just like, that might, maybe, I don't know, maybe that works for you if you are in a small, like, uh, New England state and you're just trying to, like, concentrate a few thousand people there. But if you're in the world of, uh, like, ideas where you're trying to, like, talk to people outside of uh, an all, already pretty small bubble, then you need to, like, have a respectful tone with mm -hmm. people and um, talk to them in terms that 
are not like you're an idiot if you don't accept the non-aggression principle or you're evil. Um, yeah. That's that's just kind of a like a, a strategy for being forever marginal. And I don't think I the point that our country is at right now, like it's not even about like libertarianism winning or whatever. It's just like. I feel like America like needs libertarianism badly. It needs to like it, it's America's like the federal government's not going to become libertarian like in my lifetime. I don't think, but it's like we need a little bit more. Like maybe yeah. we're not going to get Javier Malay in twenty twenty eight, but something that looks you know more like less like Trump Vance and more like Vivek Ramaswamy and you know some other li more libertarian influence on the GOP, someone more like Jared Polis in the Democratic Party, and then like a real like contender like a, it, that has some name recognition in the Libertarian Party. That would be like a more healthy situation in my mind where you've got yeah. like something, a little bit of something on in each side that uh, Libertarians could like, uh, as opposed to the situation right now where it's just like, what is the least catastrophic outcome? That's how I feel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, there, there's a lot to, to unpack. And I, I was hoping uh, earlier this year that Dave Smith would be the nominee. More than anything, Zach, is just the platform he has. And he's very charismatic. And again, I've only been listening to him for about a year. Um, and I've been libertarian circles for almost 20 years. So I... Mm -hmm. like, But the fact that he can go on Joe Rogan, or he can yeah. debate on X, or he can you know, debate Dennis Prager or then talk to Tucker Carlson or Candace Owens. Like these people I know he has philosophical disagreements with, but send a message that I, like, it kind of reminds me of Ron Paul a little bit, you know, just like to get, get people excited. And I think there's an argument, you want votes, you want party members, but whether you get 2% or three and a half percent, I mean, like who cares? <laughs> So yeah. what, what big, they, you know, Dave, Dave, I'll just say one last thing about Dave, which is that um, I agree it's great to have him on J the Joe Rogan experience and spread kind of w getting people acquainted with these ideas that otherwise never would have heard them. And he's good at articulating that. The one area where like a really substantive area where I think he uh, is off the mark is immigration. And that's really a big divide between mm -hmm. the Mises camp and the rest of the the libertarian movement. Um, I will just recommend uh, we hosted a debate on our show between Dave and Chris Freiman on uh, immigration. Um, and if anyone's interested in that, it's a really important issue for libertarians to think about, not only because it's now being ranked as one of the t most important issues uh, for mm -hmm. Americans, um, it's the top issue for Republicans, um, but it, it, uh, touches on so many areas that libertarians should be clear on, which is like freedom of association, um, property rights, uh, freedom of contract, all that stuff is bound up in immigration. And it's a real, it can be, because uh, the system is such a mess, it can be hard to like see through all of that, but it's worth, um, unbundling that and i think we did a decent job of doing that in that, in that conversation well, we, we have to have a, a link to that because it's a super important message and and that's a, a very nuanced topic that i think we're all yeah. evolving and, and learning from it you've had a really cool career and you're still young Thank and there's, you. there's there's a lot ahead of you um but looking back zach what are what's something career-wise that you're particularly proud of i really had a transformative experience going to Hong Kong um, in 2019 as the protests were roiling and um, just seeing the energy of and the passion of people who were staring down the barrel of authoritarianism creeping into their lives and these are people who, uh, young people, mostly out there on the streets, who really, in a visceral way that you don't even see that much in America anymore, understand the value of liberty in their lives and like know 
because they know people on the other side of the border that don't have that. Uh, and they, so they have a, a deep understanding and, and passion for it. And it's, it's also just one of the more heartbreaking stories because of what it, it, I don't think it has turned out very well for Hong Kong, um, in their, they have not really been able to resist it in the long term. Um, but uh, there was a moment where I went to a soccer match and they, the government had made it, they, the movement had made up a, its own an Hong Kong anthem, which was banned. And they were just like defiantly singing it uh, over the Chinese national anthem and like booing the Chinese national anthem. Oh, well, that's a total uh, I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. And I'm stealing a line from... Uh, your your podcast, Zach. What's a question I should be asking? Um. Oh man, this is what I do to people all the time, <laughs> and they just like blank out. And now I'm getting a taste of my own medicine. What's a question more people should be asking? I think that um, more people should be asking, what can I do to like we all have these high minded political values and we get in all these fights online and rage against what the federal <laughs> government is doing. Um, but there are things that you can do um, to make your own life more free and also the people around you, whether that is, you know, supporting certain technologies that make it easier to communicate, you know, using encryption or buying some Bitcoin or, right. uh, you know, sending your kids to like a school that is more of a free thinking environment. Like these are all things that you can take on in your own life. So I guess I would say, what can I do to make the world more free? I love that. And this is a question I conclude my interviews with. Uh, Zach, what are you most optimistic about? I'm most optimistic about the fact that the, that I actually, okay, I know what it is. It's the fact that the gatekeepers are clearly losing that it, we went through this dark time in the 2020 era and it exposed a lot of what was being done behind the scenes at twitter for instance now twitter is owned by someone else who has a different attitude we also have technology um that makes it so if that ever changes um there's networks that cannot be controlled like that infrastructure already exists i'm on a there's a network called nostra that i would suggest people who are interested in this kind of thing check out um there is i mentioned bitcoin it's an un decentralized uncontrollable money there's more ways to get your voices out than ever before um i think the the kind of post covid exodus has really changed the map and also changed the way that states think about governing so there's a lot more freedom to vote with your feet and also like go somewhere where a like a freer world is being built um and that is what i'm most optimistic about is that while they're like wailing and whining about the latest thing, the latest thing was like the AI, the Grok AI that lets you make a picture of Trump, like flying okay. a plane into the Twin Towers or whatever. It's like they can whine about all this stuff all they want, but there's actually nothing they can do about it anymore. So that's what I'm optimistic about. Very cool. Well, Zach, thank you so much for joining us. Please come back soon. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Matt Balaker podcast. To learn more, please check out mattbalaker.com and encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it.